This has been a very busy first spring semester. Yeah, no kidding. For a five minute piece, these documentary films were a ton of work. But they all paid off in the end. We have some great final products. Absolutely, like our documentary on the new gallery in Reichhold. I think there's a great move by the art department. There are some amazing pieces of work in there. And the profile piece that Jess and I did on Teresa Gallagher, we all see her in the dining hall every day, but we really got to know her. I know, we got a better appreciation for dogs on campus now. Yeah, who knew what an emotional impact these canine companions had on their owners and on the campus community. Well, okay, Jen and I found some really interesting events off campus, like recreational sports in town. They're popular among students and town members alike, both on campus and off. You know who loves sports? Corey Warsham did. And in our piece, we illustrated the impact of his death, more importantly, his life on the campus community. Yeah, it really was an excellent opportunity to celebrate uh, what a great guy he was, and now we always have something to remember him by. The Colby Sawyer Insights gives everyone a chance to look back on some of the important things that happened in 07. Now, finally, you can sit back, relax, and watch them. That's exactly why Brian and I brought in a special musical guest. But who? That's Gary Robinson. Who's Gary Robinson? Well, why don't we take a look into our documentary? Here's to you, Mr. Robinson. Take away Gary and take away Colby Story Insights. My name is Gary Robinson, and I'm a visiting professor at Colby Sawyer College, or an adjunct professor at Colby Sawyer College for the last, I guess visiting would be the wrong term because I've been there for 32 years. I've known my friend Gary for a good long time. Um, originally I knew Gary because his children came to Windy Hill. Um, Gary has three children, all grown up now. He's a big supporter of, of the theater here and, and the music uh, program, and he's always been made himself available to the students. Well, I just know him as a, a supporter of the arts, as an active guitar player. He plays beautiful classical guitar. But I started playing trumpet when I was about seven or eight years old and uh, studied once a week with private lessons, so forth and so on. And then at age 14, I was unfortunately told I needed braces. so. I got braces and um, bleeding profusely from my mouth from trying to play the trumpet uh, with the braces on. It, it was obvious that I couldn't play the trumpet. And um, I was a little, you know, as a, little, as a young teenager, I was a little upset about that. But my mother went out and bought me a guitar, and that was how I began. To. So I ended up actually studying in the beginning with, with um, a very fine cellist and then finally a very fine bassist. And then from there I um, heard about a maestro in Milano by the name of Miguel Ablonis and he happened to come every year to Ithaca College. After some discussion and some letters and recommendations and back and forth, he accepted me as a student of his in, uh, in Milano. And that was where really I had my formal training on the instruments. As a child growing up, where I come from a big ski family and we had a home in um, in a uh, ski house in northern New Hampshire, Bethlehem, and Ski Cannon Mountain. And I met my, actually I met my, uh, my wife there. After we were married, we lived in, uh, in uh, uh, Switzerland for a year. And when we came back to the States, I was working at a festival up in uh, Jefferson, New Hampshire, called the White Mountain Festival for the Arts. And um, we wanted to stay in New Hampshire. We liked the, um, you know, the physical part of New Hampshire, the, the, the beauty of the country. And we came down and looked at Dartmouth, and then we looked at New London, and the college looked quite charming. Gary also taught music um, at Windy Hill for a while, too, so we had the fun of Gary coming in. Gary's a really um, interesting, humorous person, and because Gary loves music, he wants um, to inculcate that same kind of joyous feeling about music with with children and everyone else. He plays locally. He also plays in Italy and Spain. He's he's an internationally known guitarist. He's worked with Mary Travis, the um, uh, Peter Paul and Mary, and John Sebastian of the Love and Spoonful. Uh, Dave Brubeck. When I first came to the air, I I actually played quite extensively on the college market. And I've probably played every school in New England two or three times. But, you know, the, the road work can get old, you know. Going, sleeping in hotel rooms night after night can get very old. He's an important part of the cultural uh, world here in, uh, in New London. I know that he has a salsa factory. It's the great American story. I started selling salsa off the back of my station wagon. And Gary Robinson used to ski uh, King Ridge as the Mad Hatter. Oh, the Mad Hatter. Uh, I used to dress up in a costume that stood about eight feet high, and uh, I skied in it. 
To be a complete human being, you've got to do both sides. You've got to be physical and you've got to be mental. And so I've tried to stay active all year long. Um, you know, I actually skied today. It was a beautiful day. I also love to play golf. I'm a, a, just a golf addict. Um, it's a very difficult game, and um, I don't know how good I'm at at it, but uh, I continue to try to self-improve. So I play a lot of golf. I think it's important um, for my music. The Greeks actually used to say, uh, until you're 35, you should do some kind of a discipline like that, some kind of an art discipline every day. If you don't know by now, we'll ain't no use to sit and wonder why, babe. It don't matter anyhow when the rooster crows at the break of dawn. Look out your window, I'll be gone. You're the reason that I'm traveling on Don't think twice, it's all right Yeah, my pleasure. Hi, I'm Les Lynch. And I'm Jenna Payton. And we're going to take a look at some recreational sports off campus and the people who play them. They provided enjoyment for Colby Sawyer students and townspeople alike. We're going to profile sports like... Soccer. Golf. And basketball. Let's take a look. Uh, Grantham Indoor is a 35,000 square foot building. It's broken up into two sections, actually three sections. Section one is the soccer component. Section two is the golf component. And section three is Spike's Restaurant. During the week, in the evenings, we have our adult programs on the weekend, and after school programs are the youth programs. Pretty competitive, pretty strong players. Uh, then you, we have, you know, and as the, the players are older, uh, you see the skills enhanced. The physical game may not be as, as strong as it was, but the, uh, especially with the indoor game, it's quick touches and it's, um, it's more of a thinking game where you have to be really aware of who's around you, where outdoors you have a lot more space. Um, these guys still have it, you know, for being a little bit older. Um, they can still run, they can move the ball. Um, communication on the field is still, you know, very present. Um, you know, they know the game of soccer. Um, they have more experience, they can actually teach you a lot more, you can learn from them. As far as their abilities, uh, different teams have different styles. And some people are more aggressive, some people are less aggressive. Um, some people, they've played together for a long time, so they have a good sense of their teammates. And some people are just starting to gel in here. It's definitely something that's a lot of fun and you look forward to in the spring. And there were some characters that came in here, and they are characters. And they'd say, why can't we hit golf balls in here? And the golf machines are the simulators where you can play 50 different courses. It's an indoor simulator where you hit into a screen and it projects it in the ball that shows you where the ball goes. And they let us use it for two hours every day. We go up there. So, you know, they're very friendly. Average, decent golfers, you know, the ones that just want to go up there and just swing the clubs, you know, nothing. They're not shooting for score. They're just out there having a fun time. But it provides the opportunity for people to keep their swing. Uh, the folks that are going to Myrtle Beach in February or the folks that are going to Florida for the winter and want to bone up and get ready for it or for that vacation. They want to get their swing in shape, they'll come in here and play. The leagues we run, we run from October uh, through May, well, actually through April, and that's for people that just want to continue to play golf. Uh, basically what we do is uh, we get the gym 8 to 10 or 9, 9 to 10 depend on what part of the year it is during the winter they like it 9 to 9 to 11 it's just that you know we show up pick up and we you know 
you know, make the teams even as we can, and we play. Well, I've been playing basketball my whole life. Since 88 on, I've been playing it, and basically, I took over running it like 10 years ago. And I would say that this ranks up there. I mean, we've got a good group of guys that ranges in age. I mean, you know, I'm 36. There's guys that are clearly in their 50s. There's one guy that's 73, I think, is, and uh, they all run it you know, their own levels, and I think we got a good, definitely a good mix of, of guys out there. Some guys have played college for UConn, and I think UMaine, so there's definitely a good good range of, of folks out there that bring different skills to the game. You know, uh, college basketball, you know, was great basketball. It's pretty competitive. It's Division Two, but it was still, you know, very competitive. And this is, uh, you know, although it's competitive, everybody's a bit older, a bit slower, <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, it's more for fun and to kind of keep your cardiovascular uh, things going versus anything else. The best thing now is that it's just, we play for fun, you know, and it's a way to try to stay in shape. You do it because you love the game. You know? just want to get out there and, um, you know, toss the ball around a little bit, run up and down the court, go back home with a sweat and take a nice hot shower at the end of the day. I think the biggest draw is that everybody comes here and they have a good time. There's a lot of laughter out in the court. Clearly being an athlete doesn't stop after college. Guess the only thing left to do now is play. Colby Sawyer is home to many subcultures, some based on interests, others on ethnicity, and one in particular on quantities of fur. That's right. CSC is currently home to five dogs, not including visitors like Bumper here and what interesting neighbors they make. I'm Pat McKinnon. And I'm Kim Wollaston. And we're going to explore the roles these dogs play on campus, and more importantly, the emotional impact that they have on their owners and on the campus community. Let's go visit a couple of our furry friends who truly illustrate the nature of the canine companion. Who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who? Emotionally, he's, he's fantastic. And you come home after a long day and, you know, he's going to crash on the couch with you and you just sit and watch TV. Um, he's very affectionate. And I think that's, you know, helped me the times I've been really busy and just come home and needed some TV time. Um, and we've, we've shared that together. So he's been wonderful. I think as far as um, influencing my life, she has emotionally... I think she knows when I have good days and bad days, um, so she'll just try to like comfort me and always want to be on my lap. Um, she's definitely a lap dog and a half. She has um, moments when she wants to be stubborn and moments when she just loves it and loves life and loves being with me. So The relationship between a, a dog, or really any pet it seems, but a dog specifically and its owner is really kind of complex psychologically. I mean, because people, um, have this emotional bond with a dog that seems like the dog is giving it back. In other words, it's not a, just a one-way street uh, the way it might be, say, in, um, in some other pets like fish or, or what have you. Um, that does a lot for the owner, and uh, not only the owner, but also the people around them. Specifically within Lawson, he's got a lot of great relationships with students. Yes, I know Kingsley. Uh, every time Andy takes him outside, uh, he brings King uh, Kingsley runs on into our suite there's a little circle around and says hi to everybody. Generally, we, we, we walk him in this direction where there are bigger fields, there are places that he can run off the leash, chase a ball. But when I take him around campus, people seem to know him and say hello and come up and pet him. And I think that, you know, to a different degree, students often get the same kind of thing, you know, the emotional benefits out of having Kingsley around that I do. And I get to sit with him on the couch for a couple of hours and, you know, watch CNN. But you know, students just get to see him for five minutes and it takes their mind off of a test or, um, you know, something else that, that's stressful. Well, I think, you know, being a psychology major, we know that animals do reduce stress and being, you know, I've had pets my whole life and I kind of go through, you know, kind of pet withdrawal. So it's good to have an animal on campus to be able to play with. They're very, you know, they reduce your stress and everything like that. So I think that you know, it is nice. I used to just go to the pet stores in Concord to play with animals, but now I can just go downstairs. Studies have shown, for example, that just petting a, a dog or a cat um, can lower one's blood pressure, 
that there are some autonomic nervous system responses when one is around, you know, a gentle creature like a dog um, that I think can be helpful in um, any kind of, especially institutional settings where people are surrounded mainly by other humans and mainly by, um, you know, kind of like an educational or hospital environment. It's funny because when I was told that I was able to have a, a pet and if I had a pet then I could bring it, I was like, well, this is different. I'm curious how students would react because I know for the most part students are like, I wish I could have a dog, I wish I could have, you know, another pet besides a fish. And for her, it's allowed students to, if they miss their pet from home, they can come down and hang out or they always play with her outside. And it reassures them that, you know, there is, you know, some sort of pet that they can play with. Regarding the issue of dogs on campus, you know, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of questions, you know, in what way is the dog going to be, uh, is going to behave, how are they going to be in the dorm settings, um, how are they going to interact with people, etc. I think on the whole, though, there are certainly studies that show that that kind of interaction between humans and dogs in, a situ in, a, in an environment like a college campus can actually be really beneficial in ways that people can't even predict. She has been a positive part of my life, and I love her. She's a kid in my own eyes. <laughs> you know, he's just kind of a, a lug of a dog. These campus dogs are more than just pets. They are a source of comfort, companionship, and stress relief for their owners and the students they encounter. So next time that you're feeling lonely or overwhelmed with your studies, know that there's always a wagging tail close by. Hi, my name is Charlotte Stewart, and we're in the cafeteria where we met one of the most beloved college community members. You will soon see what an amazing woman, mother, and friend Teresa really is. Hi, I'm Jess Gallade, and this is a life of Mama T. My name is Teresa Gallagher. My job title here at Kobe Sawyer is the dining room floor supervisor. Um, so I take care of basically the dining room, make sure that everyone's happy and everything is cleaned and in order. I, right away is a welcoming personality. When I first met her, um, I was taken in by her friendliness and her, um, her smile, her <laughs> eyes. And uh, she is just uh, a, a very welcoming person that's open arms. She's awesome. She's always happy. She's always in the calf, like singing, dancing, setting up conversations. She's, she's awesome. Teresa is a very friendly lady and she's open-minded and welcomes us into the lunchroom every day. All she talks about is college students, you know. She knows every one of us by name. Um, she knows all about our lives. She makes us part of her daily life. She likes to come in in the morning and just say hi to all of us. You know, she could care less about doing her job if she can say hi to all of us. The Colby Sawyer students are my life. Oh my goodness, you guys don't even realize how much fun I have and I enjoy you. Um, it's just working and playing, it's not the job, it's not the money here, it is all about the students. I really enjoy being here, playing with you and raising heck with you. It's like being one of you. <laughs> I'm almost 50 and I can say I'm still at the college. Woo -hoo! <laughs> just one day I was uh, down here, I was really pissed off and um, I was making a bagel and it was in one of the in-between times when no one was here and she just started like fixing the bread next to me and she looked at me and I guess she saw I was mad and she started like dancing around me singing I think it was Waltz and Matilda and yeah it just kind of made me smile and I, I see her do that kind of stuff all the time. This is a song that never ends Oh it goes on with all my friends Some people just don't want to sing It's not knowing what they do And if you come to Kobe Sawyer you can Teresa is like a mother figure for everyone who comes into the CAF, seeing how she is a mother. She knows how to treat kids, she's open-minded, talks to everyone, doesn't matter what year you are, she's always there to listen to you. Teresa, well, or Mama T, is a name that the, some students came up with for her, but she does take each one of the students and makes them her own. She is a mother of three but she really is a mother of, of hundreds. My favorite part of working at Kobe Sawyer, I don't know, 
there's so many good things. I mean, when you get a hug from a student, or they say you're the greatest or you're the best, when you finally meet them on the first day, and they're a freshman and they're scared, and then you see them in their cap and gown four years later, and they just got all this confidence and they're ready to go out there. I, I don't think you can put one favorite point because every day is different. Yeah. So. Well, Teresa has uh, made it a point to be involved in the community service uh, um, club here on, on campus. And what it is is because she is so service oriented that she just fell in love with that group because that's just a bunch of students that are doing what she does every day. Community Service Club, I am a volunteer there. I've gone for the last two years with the students down to New Orleans. And a uh, year before last, we went down and we stayed in Bay St. Louis. Uh, and we did a lot of mucking of houses, cleaning, ha um, enjoying people that we met down there. We the big thing here on campus is that every year there is a Staff Employee of the Year award. And Teresa this year won that award, which we think is just the greatest thing. I was given the Employee of the Year award here at Kobe Sawyer. That was probably like the most, besides giving birth to my children, probably one of the most wonderful things that have ever happened to me in my life. Um, it was just, it was an incredible, I had to cry. In a way, it was like I held it together until everyone left, but President Tom Galligan had a beautiful speech and really made me feel very honored and very special, and it was just wonderful. We're like a family. I think Kobe Story is a community within a community. There's just, it's here. Yeah. Did you know that art is on the move? Yeah, there's even a new gallery on campus. But where? That's what we wanted to find out. I'm Matthew Erickson. And I'm Jonathan Match. Come along with us as we investigate Art on the Move. We uh, have been involved in the planning stages for a new um, Fine and Performing Arts Center. Um, uh, our present facilities at Sawyer Center were outdated and overcrowded. In that process, that means we are going to, at some point, have to relocate while um, the new parts of the building are being built. They moved the drawing studio over there this year to have more space for not only the drawing students but also the printmaking students. Because the drawing studio and the printmaking studio were in one room and things got complicated and it was really cramped. So we moved um, all the beginning and advanced drawing over to Reichold where we are now. Started out just um, putting some work up from the drawing classes but then I thought well why don't we initiate or try to get going some kind of student gallery space. We decided okay well let's brainstorm and try to come up with a name. We kind of based it on the name of the building and the whole notion of the right side of the brain so that's why we called it the Reich side gallery. It was just in the beginning we would hang up our drawings and those were up at first and then I think now they are just doing all different classes because we had drawing up and there was photo stuff up. My students um, were the first students to show in the right side gallery for the month of March. Since it's supposed to be student driven, wouldn't it be wonderful if I had a class hang it? It's a brand new thing that's happening so I don't really know how many students got over there. I did hear a few comments but not as many as I would like to. It's kind of in an obscure place. I think it's a little slow kind of catching on right now. I think it's going to take a little time to kind of get everyone organized, but everyone likes it. It's just going to have to take a few months to catch on, and then people will know, oh, there's always a show up every month. Let's go over there. So it's always good to have artwork up everywhere, and it always makes a place look better, no matter where it is. It could be in the bathroom. It could be in a bathroom stall. It makes you feel better, it makes you excited, and it makes you driven. It's very casual, very informal. Um, you know, we want the work to, um, you know, to be able to be seen in reasonably well. But it's not, it's not the same as the current Mugar Gallery, which is, you know, a little more formal. It gives the students a place to display their work, because for the most part, the main gallery on campus, there's only one student show, and you only get a select number of pieces to go into it. And this kind of gives the students a place to display their work on a regular basis so people can see what the students are making. Well, I like the idea of spreading out art because a lot of people don't go over to the dark side of campus. So I like the idea of having 
you know, art in two separate places where people can experience it. I think it will end up being an art student society thing where people can give us proposals on shows they want to do and we'll pick and vote on which shows we want to do. But we'll be starting that next year. The wonderful thing about having this new art space is that it gives everybody on campus, not just the students, but faculty, staff, anybody that works here or goes here every day, no matter what means, can go over and hang their stuff. Well, I was thinking about just showing some things on campus. Well, originally I was thinking about showing things in my apartment. Um, and then I thought, well, if I'm going to do it, it'd be nice to do it over a period of time so that more people have a chance to see it. Because again, when you make something, uh, for better or for worse, you want other people to look at it. And uh, Bert suggested that I just put the stuff up here, that there is this sort of this alternative space being opened here, and why not have the show here in April? Uh, it's a much less formal space uh, as opposed to over in Sawyer, where it's kind of, it's either Jerry or artists coming from the outside. We had music at the opening, um, you know, uh, maybe that was a little bit different. Immediately, this is already a space that's not obviously a gallery space. It's a hallway. It ended up working out much better than I had expected, or looking much better than I expected. I think it brings more of a community feel to the school, bringing in the teachers and the students and collaborating and work. I think that's good. I think it only makes students feel, you know, validated in the fact that they can share the same space with professors and with students. I think that that's really nice. It's another less formal place to show your work. So it's more relaxed, but it gives kids a place to start understanding how to hang their own work and eventually start doing their own openings. It's kind of a training tool. Well, it will be interesting to see how involved the students become. And I really think it will make them uh, more involved because they know it's their own. Being student driven, hopefully it will be student operated and, and the initiative behind the exhibitions will belong to the students. I think having something that's their own is going to get them more excited about art and I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to get them in interested in trying new things. So I think it's just going to bring something new and different and hopefully really cool to campus. Corey Warsham was an important member of the Colby Sawyer community. He was a leader on campus in the classroom and on the soccer field. Hi, I'm Casey Ford. And I'm Brian Doucette. And we're going to show you how Corey Warsham continues to affect the Colby Sawyer community months after his death. Now at 5.30, a tragic loss for a local college community after a student athlete loses his life in a weekend crash. One year ago, just weeks before his brother escaped a fiery car crash, Corey survived one too. Now, there were many tears this afternoon as Colby Sawyer students and staff gathered in the student center. The college president, Corey's coach, teachers, friends all said a few words. Reporting live, Paige Cornblue, WMUR News 9. When I first found out about Corey's death, I was actually abroad over in Italy. And uh, I got a phone call at like 4 in the morning from Josh Denall. And like I was so excited to hear his voice. And like he asked me if he'd woke me up. And I was like, no, man, no. And like I was just so stoked to hear him. And then when he told me, he was like, my whole world shattered. The passing of Corey has definitely changed things a lot around here. Um, people are more friendly with each other now, and like I think a lot of people are closer than they were before. I think Corey's passing had uh, probably one of the strongest effects that, of any other situation on campus because I think it really realized made us realize how uh, strong of relationships we've had just from knowing each other from a year. I just remember being completely still and having so much run through my mind and then all of a sudden I kind of realized that what really was going on. I was doing homework and my roommate called me and told me that he died and I didn't really believe it at first because of his accident last year and it just really didn't hit me. The effect on campus was pretty severe I think. I know that I missed a whole week of classes. When we first heard, uh, first had the news of Corey's death that Sunday night, we were shocked and sad like everyone else and we knew that the campus would be absolutely devastated because he was so loved and because we're such a small, close campus. Well, of course, the school mobilized fast. Um, the counselor on call that evening was in touch with um, the RD on call and with campus safety to see if any any help was needed that night. Our uh, idea was to be available but uh, not to be intrusive because everyone 
deals with death in a different way. Corey and I got to know each other his first uh, semester on campus. He was my advisee. He appreciated life. He recognized he had been given a second chance. He was very determined, very enthusiastic, and uh, willing uh, to engage himself. My initial reactions when I learned of his death were just deep, deep sadness. I didn't know how to approach my first class. He was a student in my 8 a.m. class on Monday morning and to try to think about how to go in and help those students while I was still suffering in, uh, myself was a real, real challenge. Here at Colby Sawyer, it's, you know, it's different, you know, like everyone knew him and everyone has like great stories about him and everyone remembers him for all, you know, the cool things, you know, or good times that they had with him. It's going to be very difficult coming back to, coming back to preseason and not having, you know, that face to, you know, to play with. It'll be the first time in, in almost like 10 years that I haven't played with him. He always tried his best to do, you know, the most that he could for the team. And, um, you know, that's going to be something that will be hard to replace and hard to get over. It was difficult, a difficult year for us all, uh, but I think uh, I'm hopeful that uh, as a result of this, it uh, will bring out uh, the best in all of us. You know, you read about it every day in the newspaper, you read about it, uh, you hear about it, uh, but when it hits home like that, it all of a sudden takes on a much larger dimension. Corey was our teammate for two years, and uh, it's pretty vocal on the team, so you know, he's one of the most liked kids on the team. I think it uh, made everyone realize that life can be short and you know, not to dwell on small things and just realize that you know, the people that are around you aren't always going to be there, so you just really got to enjoy the time you have with them. I think it already has made our team grow up a lot and mature a lot as people and players. A lot of us are not taking for granted the opportunities we have anymore. A lot of us realize how important it is and how lucky we are to play soccer. It's been pretty mellow. P people have kind of taken back by what happened and whatnot. I think people are more or less helping one another and you can tell that the campus is a little closer than it ever was before and I, I think that Corey's death has impacted everybody and realized that you only have a certain amount of time to be here and you got to make the take the fullest of that.